Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first session of today's symposium. Uh, for everybody that hasn't met me yet, my name is Christian, and I'm a senior research scientist here at the ISB, and I will be sharing the first session of the symposium today. And yeah, without much ado, let's jump right into the first session of the symposium. Our first speaker will be Dr. Cecilia Naker. And Dr. Naker, please feel free to start sharing your slides while I introduce you. So Dr. Cecilia Naker is a microbiome scientist, educator, and new assistant professor in biological science at Minnesota State University in Mankato. She holds a PhD in genome sciences from the University of Washington, where she worked on bioinformatic methods for integrating microbiome omics data and modeling microbial community metabolism with Alan Alan and Bornstein. She completed a postdoc fellowship in microbiology with Peter Turnbow at UCSF, where she studied the metabolism and genome evolution of human gut actinobacteria. At MSU Mankato, her research group is interested in using experimental and computational tools to dissect the evolutionary history and metabolic lifestyles of diverse host associated microbes. So with that, let's give a huge virtual applause to Dr. Naker. And Dr. Naker, please take it away. Okay, let's see. Uh, do my slides look okay? They look great, yes. Lovely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much to Sean and Christian and to everybody involved in making this event happen. I attended a previous edition of this symposium, and I feel very fortunate to be starting off this event with so many great speakers. Um, so yeah, I am a brand new faculty member at, here at Minnesota State University Mankato. And today I'm going to be mostly talking about a study uh, that I did in my postdoc research at UC San Francisco with Peter Turnbaugh, uh, where we were trying to understand the metabolic dependencies and interactions of this particularly common and interesting uh, gut microbial species. Uh, let's see. There we go. So the, the theme of the session here today, this morning, is commensal pathobiont interactions and disease. And I thought maybe I would start with this question asking how well can we really distinguish um, which microbes are playing what role in the human gut ecosystem? So I know that we you know, it's human nature to want to put things into boxes. And maybe as we learn about members of the microbiome, we like to organize them, maybe somewhat like this diagram I came across online, right? Um, listing examples that we typically think of as good or bad bacteria, right? Um, and so this is obviously oversimplified. Uh, you can maybe start to identify some inconsistencies here, right? So for example, there are strains of E. coli that can be probiotics and staph is actually quite often a member of the healthy skin microbiome. And uh, on the flip side, right, there are strains of lactobacillus like l inners that have been linked to poor outcomes. Um, and so on top of this, you know, furthermore, there are many microbial taxa in the human gut that we still have no idea what the nature of their host interactions might be. So as we think about this topic together today, I just want to raise this idea that maybe many microbial taxa have the potential to act as a commensal or as a beneficial mutualist even, or even also as a pathobiont, maybe depending on context, on strain variation, um, on the presence of other microbes. And so it's important for us to be thinking about that environmental context and uh, the ecology and evolution of these microbes across their environments. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm starting here not to get into a rabbit hole about the definitions of these terms, but just to have this ambiguity in mind as I introduce you to this particular gut microbial species that I've been thinking about for the last few years that does not fit very neatly into any of these boxes. Um, and so that species is called Agrothella lenta. It's a gram-positive member of the actinobacterial phylum, uh, or actinomycetota under the new names, I guess. And uh, I think Elenta is an interesting case study when we're thinking about 
uh, the beneficial or detrimental roles of human gut microbes, because first of all, it's extremely prevalent um, among healthy adult humans, especially in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Based on this survey of public data that we did, we saw prevalence rates of Elenta greater than 50% in healthy adults. Um, and it seems to be particularly common in industrialized populations. So um, we've seen actually prevalence as high as uh, over 90% in some recent unpublished data uh, from the US. Um, so a lot of people have Elenta in their guts and are perfectly healthy. And so we might think of it acting as a commensal there. But on the other hand, it's also been consistently linked to disease. Uh, so my former colleague Maggie showed that it can be a contributor to the development of autoimmune disease. And it also is a relatively frequent causative agent in certain bacteremias uh, in vulnerable populations. Um, and so for those reasons, I think some people would definitely put Elenta into the category of a pathobiont or something with pathogenic potential, at least. Um, and I think this species gets even more interesting when we start to think about what its actual functional capabilities are. Um, and really, it's been, this species has been found to display a really wide variety of unusual traits. So even just the type strain of Elenta encodes 30 or 40 uh, enzymes in its genome that are sort of unusual reductases that are not really found in many other taxa. And work by the Turnbaugh lab and others have identified the substrates of these enzymes as being this array of different dietary, xenobiotic, and endogenous compounds, including some of the categories shown here. Um, and so as we think about the the consequences of those metabolic transformations by Elenta in the gut, um, uh, some of their effects might be beneficial and some of them might be detrimental. So one example here is uh, bile acid metabolism. Elenta can transform bile acids to produce this secondary bile acid 3-oxo-LCA, which was shown by this group at Harvard to be uh, inhibitory to autoimmune Th17 cells. However, the Turnbaugh lab also found that the Elenta cardenolide metabolizing enzyme, so a different enzyme, different substrate, um, uh, can transform an endogenous substrate in a way that leads to activation of autoimmune linked Th17 cells. And so I think this really nicely highlights that we really need to be thinking about, again, the ecological and evolutionary context around what Elenta might be doing and whether it's having beneficial or detrimental effects in the human gut. Um, so at the beginning of my postdoc, when I was learning about what we knew about Elenta to date, it just seemed like we had these puzzle pieces that didn't fit together when you look at them from the perspective of the, the fitness of the organism. So we knew it had this specialized strain variable metabolism, but a lot of those reactions didn't seem to benefit the growth of Elenta in any clear way. Um, and we knew that it was slow growing, but also incredibly prevalent. And we also knew that it was fully asaccharolytic, meaning it does not metabolize sugars or carbohydrates at all. So this is not one of our fiber fermenting gut bacteria. Um, it instead, uh, what was known about it was that it seems to grow better when provided with a lot of this amino acid arginine. Um, so I really wanted to better put these pieces together and understand the, the full network of how do, how uh, do these metabolic transformations enable Elenta to do all the things it needs to grow as a bacteria to obtain energy, carbon, and nitrogen to synthesize biomass and achieve this uh, slow growing yet high prevalence in the gut? Um, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm mostly going to tell you about my efforts to answer that question. And so most of this work was published earlier this year in PLOS Biology, so you can check it out there. Um, but as I said, the general 
goal here was we wanted to understand what were the nutrient requirements of Elenta, how does that lead to its metabolic effects on its environment, and then furthermore, to what extent are those traits predictable and understandable from the genome uh, using computational modeling? Um, how do those traits vary across these different strains of Elenta that we've seen can have potentially different host effects? Um, and then how does what we learn about Elenta's physiology in a lab setting uh, compare to what we actually see happening in a host-associated environment? Um, so before I get into this, there was, there was first a technical problem that I had to solve, which was that Elenta is a bit difficult to grow in the lab. And previously, folks tip, typically grew it in this brain heart infusion media. And so this is, if you haven't cultured a lot of gut anaerobes, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's derived from pig and cattle byproducts. And when we analyzed BHI with untargeted metabolomics, we detected over 15,000 chemical features. And so this just makes it really difficult to tell what's going on with any individual metabolic pathway to detect very sensitively if Elenta might be producing or using something. Um, so I really needed a way to grow Elenta in a simpler, defined, minimal culture condition where we knew everything that was there and could more sensitively look at the role of individual metabolites and pathways. Um, and so the, to solve this problem, I use the tools of genome-based metabolic network modeling, which I want to introduce now and which you're already familiar with if you participated in the, in the ISB course yesterday. Um, so this is basically just this idea that we can take a bacterial genome sequence identify the genes that are present that look like they encode enzymes performing particular reactions and build that up into a network model of how all those reactions fit together. Um, so in our case, I looked at uh, initial metabolic reconstructions of Elenta and noticed that things like none of them encode any genes for tryptophan biosynthesis. So that told me, you know, any minimal media we try to grow Elenta in, we need to make sure we include tryptophan and so on. Um, and so that allowed us to design this chemically defined media where we could grow Elenta and it would grow nearly as well as it did in the traditional rich media condition. Um, and so, with that in hand, I could then go ahead and do all of this physiological profiling of this organism's metabolism. So we looked at produced and depleted compounds with untargeted metabolomics in the volcano plot here. Um, and I also did a bunch of uh, growth experiments to look at the role of individual nutrients uh, on on the growth and fitness of this organism. So um, in gray here is just growth in um, the, our regular media condition. And then the colored line indicates when each of these compounds are removed. Um, so I did so many growth experiments. This was kind of my pandemic undertaking. And uh, we found a couple things just to highlight here that arginine, appeared to be really essential for growth, which was not surprising since we thought it was pretty important previously. Um, but then we were also interested in the role of acetate and its importance for growth of Elenta. Um, and the reason for that is that acetate is a really abundant and consequential metabolite that's produced by lots of the fiber fermenting members of the gut. Um, so I was interested in following up on that and trying to understand the importance of acetate for Elenta specifically. Um, and so to do this, I was really fortunate to work with some great mass spec collaborators, Brian and Juan. And so we did this stable isotope resolved metabolomics where we fed these Elenta cultures uh, chemically labeled acetate with a 13C carbon isotopes and then looked for metabolites containing those labels um, in both uh, cell lysates and supernatants of those cultures. And we did this with acetate and we also did this with arginine to compare the roles of each of these compounds. Um, 
And so this is kind of a simplified map summarizing the massive amount of data that we collected in these experiments. And what we found is really that acetate seems to be a preferred carbon source for biosynthesis of a lot of different biomass components, including peptidoglycan, nucleic acids, and vitamins like pantothenic acid. Um, and acetate this seems to be true, even though this is an energetically expensive process to incorporate it into pyruvate and then into glucose. Um, and that's very different from what we saw with arginine here, um, which we knew was important for growth of Elenta. That was like the one thing we knew. But it was, and so we thought arginine might be a carbon source for Elenta. It's listed that way in some databases, but it doesn't really seem to be using it as a carbon source at all. It's really strictly using arginine to generate ATP and then produce ornithine as a byproduct. Um, which might have some implications for other microbes in the gut environment that can use ornithine. Um, and so I think overall, this, uh, this picture, these experiments are telling us that Elenta is filling a relatively unique niche among uh, members of the gut microbiota, where it's relying on this really common byproduct of acetate and pairing that with being able to generate energy from arginine and potentially from other pathways. And that's leading to this really varied and unusual metabolic footprint. Um, and so this starts to fill things in a little bit, but like I said, one of the things I also really wanted to explore here was the extent to which these traits could be computationally predicted and analyzed using genome-based modeling. So I just wanna share a little bit about that here. Um, and so the tool that I was using here was uh, flux balance analysis and related constraint-based methods. And so again, you might already be an expert on this if you were at the course yesterday. But uh, basically the idea here is that we can take one of these genome-based metabolic network reconstructions that I introduced earlier um, and a set of nutrient constraints, such as knowing the list of compounds that are available in our defined minimal media, and then try and infer what's the uh, optimal set of fluxes through these different reactions that are going to best, most efficiently support biomass production by this organism in this particular environment. What's the combination of reactions and at what levels? Um, so I wanted to see if we could apply this to Elenta. Um, and so when I did that, um, our first attempts really were not very successful at all. It seemed like the model really could not recapitulate a lot of what we were seeing experimentally. Um, so here you can see we used uh, the original model to look at how the growth rate uh, would be predicted to be affected by the availability of acetate here. And so you can see that computationally under this initial model, acetate had no effect on growth of the organism. Um, but after a little bit of curation and specifically removing a reaction that um, was not very confidently supported from the genome annotations, um, the curated model then reflected the experimental dependency on acetate much more clearly. Um, and uh, consistent with our experimental data, right, on the importance of acetate. Um, and so another way we looked at this was to look at growth of Elenta across a bunch of different media conditions and look at whether the conditions where the model predicted it could grow were also the ones where we observed growth experimentally. And so we saw that the model did pretty well um, at distinguishing growth from no growth, but there were also a lot of cases where the model thought that this organism would not be able to grow in that condition, but in fact, we saw that it was just fine. And so I think that gives us uh, some uh, directions to look for new discoveries, uh, potentially novel pathways or enzyme families being used by this organism that allow it to do just fine without, for example, uh, like an example of this we saw really clearly was folate 
Um, the model thinks that Elanto really needs folate to be able to grow. It's an essential cofactor, but actually it does just fine without folate. And so maybe there's something interesting going on there with those pathways. Uh, so that's a direction for future research. Um, so overall, um, I think that gives us some of those directions to follow up on. Um, and it also gives me some confidence that these tools, which have been really primarily studied or primarily applied to really well-studied model organisms like E. coli, that we can also extend them to look at what's going on with more unusual metabolisms and more diverse bacteria like E. lenta. Um, let's see. And so one of the ways that I did want to extend this was to look at similarities and differences in the metabolism of Elenta across strains. Um, so we know that there's a lot of strain variation in Elenta metabolism. And so this is uh, this big heat map here is showing the uh, 24 or so different strains that we had metabolic reconstructions for. And then every column here is showing the predicted effect of removing one of these compounds on growth of that strain. So as you can see, actually, a lot of this core metabolism was actually really similar across the different strains. And that these genes involved in this acetate and arginine usage seem to be really conserved at the species level. Um, we did identify one kind of interesting variation, which was in uh, this vitamin pantothenic acid, uh, which is a precursor of coenzyme A from the TCA cycle. Um, and so uh, this appeared to suggest that some strains could make pantothenic acid and some strains couldn't. Um, and so our follow-up experiment testing this experimentally really nicely showed that that was exactly the case, that the strains predicted to have that full pathway did just fine if you removed pantothenic acid in the light green here, whereas the ones without that full pathway um, had substantially reduced growth in that condition. Um, and so that's a nice example of using these computational tools to inform the design of experiments, because I definitely was not going to experimentally test, you know, all strains in all conditions, but this allowed us to do that in a more targeted way. Um, the other thing I want to note here about this is that um, we really only looked at this small subset of strains that had been previously isolated and sequenced um, of this organism, but it was really an arbitrary sampling, very biased, some from uh, disease subjects, from bacteremia, some from healthy people's guts, and just really very little metadata on where these strains are coming from. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do now is really take a much bigger and more systematic look at variation in Elenta metabolism across strains and environments in a much uh, more global data set of Elenta genomes to really try to understand how both these core metabolic traits and some of these secondary specialized metabolism um, have been gained and lost. Um, and how that variation could potentially be adaptive across different host environments. So this plot is really just a little taste of that, showing what we've seen so far of the, the core and accessory genome across different functional categories. Um, but hopefully I'll have a much clearer answer to this question uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, so in the last couple minutes here, I just want to transition to this last question. So I just described a bunch of in vitro physiology experiments studying this organism and computational modeling studies. Um, and I, you know, I started with this idea that environmental context might be really important. And so does any of this stuff actually help us understand what Elenta might be doing in a mammalian host, which is which is of course a very different environment. Um, so that's what I um, did want to make sure to look at a little bit in this study. Um, and so to do that, what we did is we did a germ-free mouse experiment where we 
colonized germ-free mice with one of three different strains of Elenta for two weeks um, and collected serum and intestinal contents from from those mice and performed again on targeted metabolomics. And what was really cool here is that we used exactly the same uh, extraction and chromatography and other methodological parameters for the mass spec as we had done for our in vitro studies. Um, and so what this allowed us to do was that even if we didn't know the identity of a metabolite here from the mouse gut, we could look and see if we saw the same um, metabolite feature in any of our in vitro data suggesting it might be a new metabolite produced by Elenta, right? Um, and so as a first check of this, uh, I did an analysis where um, we looked at metabolites that were detected both in vitro in our minimal culture experiments and in vivo and compared if, if we see a feature that is increased in vitro, do we also see it's increased in in vivo? And of course, there's like a lot of reasons why that might not be true, right? Including effects of the host and the diet and things like that. Um, but we did actually find a lot of examples where this seems to be strikingly the case. Um, where things that are produced by Elenta that seem to be characteristic produced metabolites also show up in vivo. So that was nice to see. Um, oops. Um, but, you know, one big difference between these two environments is that there are a lot more potential nutrient substrates rather than the very limited like arginine, acetate, 12 other amino acids that we were providing in the minimal environment. In the gut, there's obviously way more nutrients available. Um, and so one interesting compound that we saw depleted by Elenta in vivo was this compound agmatine. So you can see from the plot here, that um, across our three intestinal sites, um, the abundance of this compound is generally quite a bit lower in the Elenta um, colonized mice versus the gray germ-free samples, although there is a little bit of variability, especially with the, um, oh, the blue strain here. I guess I left the legend off here. Sorry about that. Um, the this is one of our three strains. I believe it's the 15644 strain of Elenta. Um, so anyway, this is interesting because agmatine is a fairly physiologically important compound. It's involved in the host in uh, neural signaling and cell division. It's a precursor of the polyamine pathway. And the literature on this suggests that um, Mammal, mammals are, do not synthesize agmatine very efficiently de novo, and so they're thought to acquire most of their agmatine from uh, other sources, specifically the diet and also probably the microbiota. Um, and so this is sort of the flip side of that, right, where we're seeing a microbe that seems to be depleting it out of the gut. Um, so we noticed that Elenta had some genes in its genome that looked like the enzymes in this agmatine utilization pathway that is kind of analogous to the pathway that Elenta uses to generate ATP from arginine. Um, and so I was able to uh, go back to the lab and confirm that we can actually use agmatine as an alternative energy source for Elenta. Um, it, really does uh, just as well. I think this was the first time anybody had ever grown Elenta without arginine. Like I said, we thought it was essential, but it does just fine if you give it agmatine instead here in the pink. And we also saw that the expected genes in this pathway were induced by RNA sequencing in the presence of agmatine. So that was nice to confirm what Elenta is doing with it there. So just to bring things together and wrap things up, I think these findings support this, mo this model of um, Elenta's niche in the gut as relying on acetate as a stable carbon source and combining it with maybe scavenging a wide variety of substrates from uh, sort of lower quality energy sources that aren't taken advantage of by other um, 
other potential competitors in the gut. And it's this combination that allows Elanta to maybe have potential beneficial and or detrimental effects. And so the other note I just want to make here, I know I'm almost out of time, is that I think this project really highlights the value of kind of the interplay between these different tool sets, right, between the computational modeling, comparison across streams, and the uh, going to look at the host interactions in mouse models. Um, and so in my lab here, which is a primary undergraduate and master's institution, the niche I'm really hoping to fill is to try to extend this toolbox to more of the poorly described microbial diversity in our microbiome. So there are many other strains, many other taxa that might be having multifaceted effects like this, but nobody's looked too closely at what exactly their roles are and why that might be. Um, so I'll stop here uh, and just really acknowledge the many uh, members of the Turnbull Lab and other collaborators who helped with this project. Um, it's a fantastic place to do a postdoc. Um, and my postdoc funding sources, and then I'll also just recognize the folks who are helping me get microbiome research off the ground here in Minnesota, Mankato as well. And so thank you so much for listening. Please do get in touch if you have questions. I look forward to the panel session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Naker, for the uh, fascinating talk.